It's the largest forested wilderness in the lower 48, larger even than some states. And a lot of folks still marvel at how it came to be. It was a landmark achievement. And to see all this grassroots effort unfold and to see the tremendous response we had, it was truly historic. Historic and far-reaching, an entire ecosystem where, for better or worse, nature now rolls the dice. I think this is something the nation looks at as their magical wilderness. These things happen all over the place out there, these really unexpected things, and you can't see that anywhere in the world anymore. Not only is there the journey, there's the commitment to being there. And once you are in there, the remoteness and the vastness is really staggering. All the things we value about Idaho have their essence right there in the middle of the state, and the places work to do what nature intended to do. It's been 35 years since the creation of the River of No Return Wilderness. We may have learned to live with the compromises we've made over the years, but that's the easy part. The real challenge is to keep this remote, magical vastness intact. In the face of intense wildfires, alien species, a changing environment, and other threats. Outdoor Idaho goes exploring into the heart of the Frank. From the air, it resembles an ocean of mountains that stretch as far as the eye can see. The exact boundaries of this wilderness took years to hammer out. As early as 1973, a coalition of conservationists led by outdoor writer Ted Trueblood began rallying around a wilderness proposal of 2.3 million acres, a number they thought they could justify. But that was a number too big for the Forest Service, for timber and mining interests, and even for the most sympathetic politicians like U.S. Senator Frank Church and Governor Cecil Andrus. But it was a case of sort of training the politicians, I think would be one polite way to put it. So from day one, there was the vision of a 2.3 million acre wilderness, and the politicians all started with a much smaller number, but unlike the case of many wilderness areas, this one got bigger over time in the eyes of the politicians. And there's maybe one of the great miracles of the, of the fight for the river in return. It didn't shrink, it got just a little bigger in every iteration. The final boundaries now provide a refuge for all kinds of wildlife, including mountain goats and bighorn sheep. Idaho's ocean-going salmon and steelhead also have a safe haven in the Frank's expansive watershed. It's the size and diversity of this wilderness that makes all this possible. There are peaks that tower over 10,000 feet, where snow lingers deep into summer. There are also areas temperate enough to have attracted homesteaders, particularly along the main Salmon River and its tributaries. The stubbornness and self-reliance of these folks kept many of them along the river for decades. In 1990, during the state's centennial celebration, Idaho's outfitters paid tribute to those earlier times and to the river of no return named for the one-way journey of these wooden scows. That was a lot of fun to retrace and run as much as we could. We ran two wooden scows and people rotated through the boats. They had an opportunity to ride on one of the wooden scows. We ran quite a long stretch of river from Chalice really to Lewiston, but each portion had a different crew. This river has the opportunity for people to actually see the way America used to be. Not just the ruggedness and isolation, but the way people settled this country. The structures are still here. Their grave markers are still here. There's so much you can appreciate in the history of our nation and how the people expanded to the West. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Greg Carr is okay. a long way from home about as far from the mountains and plains of Idaho as you can get on this planet. And although it may not seem like it, this Idaho native is right where he wants to be. 
This is Gorongosa National Park, located in the country of Mozambique in the southeast corner of Africa. It's home to elephants and lions and most of the animals we associate with that continent. There's one more thing that's here, an Idaho connection, a very strong Idaho connection. In fact, it's doubtful that this million acre wildlife preserve of sweeping savannas and dazzling wetlands would even be functioning today were it not for the financial and moral support of Idahoan Greg Carr. You know, there's something very romantic about Africa. And when you come here, you feel, you feel different than you do anywhere else in the whole world. It pulls you away from the stress of your day-to-day -day life, and you just think about how magical the Earth is, how blessed we are to have such a beautiful Earth. In the 1980s, Greg Carr revolutionized the business world by providing voicemail technology to telephone companies. He also served as chairman of Prodigy, an early internet service provider. A decade later, he transitioned from making money to judiciously giving it away. He founded the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at Harvard University. And in short order, he co-founded the Museum of Idaho in Idaho Falls, helped develop the Idaho Human Rights Education Center in Coeur d'Alene, and the Anne Frank Memorial in Boise. So his interest in a national park located in a foreign country 10,000 miles away was a bit of a surprise, even to him. It began with a chance encounter with the president of Mozambique. He was just finishing his term and gonna go into the private sector. And he said to me, hey, you got any ideas of what I should do as an ex-president? So I was looking at it as how can Mozambique alleviate poverty? You know, the other nations around Mozambique, they all have multi-billion dollar safari tourism industries that create lots of jobs. I started reading about this national park called Gorongosa that in the 60s was considered the best national park in Africa. And there was a 1964 National Geographic Magazine article about Gorongosa. And I read that and I thought, well, whatever happened to that? It's true, Gorongosa was once a treasured national park, the jewel of Mozambique, easily rivaling the fabled Serengeti Plain. The thrill of seeing tens of thousands of animals thundering across the landscape brought tourists from all over the world. But like so many other young countries before it, Mozambique's fight for independence did not come easily. After battling and successfully breaking away from Portugal in 1975, a brutal civil war erupted. For 15 years, fierce fighting raged with many of the battles fought here in this park. Landmines and death eventually replaced the wildlife, decimated for meat, for sport, for ivory. When the fighting ended in 1992 with a truce and a new constitution, a million people had died, five million more displaced. In Gorongosa, the toll to this African paradise was shocking. The great thundering herds, now a distant memory. 14,000 buffalo reduced to maybe 15. From a herd of 3,000 zebra, only five could be found. The hippo numbers slashed. The few elephants that survived severely traumatized. Completely gone were the cheetahs and the leopards. And of the 500 lions that once lived here, only six remained. So I went back to the government of Mozambique and I said, hey, let's restore your national park. And when I first said that, I was saying that much more as a human rights guy or a huma humanitarian guy or an economic development guy thinking, you know, this is a great way to create jobs. It's a great way to create an economic engine in the center of your country. In 2005, Greg Carr agreed to put up $40 million of his own money 
over 20 years to restore the splendor of Gorongosa. It was an audacious, heroic project, something never before attempted, at least on this scale. It would require not only the return of wildlife, but perhaps more importantly, the cooperation from the nearby villagers who viewed the park as a way to feed their families. They are the West's sacred places, where wonder and enchantment still prevail, where you come to be reminded of what it is that's worth protecting in this world of ours. There's hundreds of miles of these headwater streams. Every little basin has a stream in it. There's a lot more length in the small streams than there are on the big rivers. And so they're important areas. For me, the character of the river is defined by the headwaters. And every time you go to the headwaters, you feel renewed and like you're just starting over again. In Idaho, headwaters are seldom easy to get to. Often they require a journey of several days on difficult trails into forgotten country. And sometimes all you find for your efforts is a trickle under a rock. It comes right out of the rocks. Very, very little ground above it, so I do believe this is the official headwater. I think we're here. But let your imagination flow. This is the fabled Selway River the only river in America to receive immediate entree into the national wilderness and the wild and scenic rivers system. It's an ecosystem that has all of the components. The Selway is the crown jewel, really, of wild rivers in the lower 48. Headwaters almost always take us to the best the West has to offer. These headwaters, the Sawtooth Mountains, are a heart center in many ways for a big chunk of Idaho. And they all run off on these separate journeys, but then in many ways converge at the same place ultimately. Idaho wouldn't be the same without them. No wonder so many are fascinated, haunted even, by the beginnings of rivers. Outdoor Idaho explores the magical world of Idaho's headwaters. Some call it the most powerful force on the planet, shaping landscapes and entire civilizations. In a mountainous region like Idaho, we can measure that force, since snowpack begets headwater streams that give rise to powerful rivers. Sometimes headwaters boil out of the earth with incredible force, like here in eastern Idaho, supplying the revered Henry's Fork with immediate respectability. But usually, Idaho's headwaters are less obvious, more subtle. Marshy areas at high elevations that are sopping wet even in the driest months of the year. Rivulets gathering strength in the spring, quickly forming creeks and tributaries. Even before the creation of Idaho territory, some of those creeks paid a heavy price for harboring the yellow stuff. For example, near Idaho City, desperate, industrious miners did everything they could to find gold in these tributaries of the Boise River. And in the process, they jump-started a state. It's been said that the care of rivers is not a question so much of rivers, but of the human heart. A river can take a thousand different shapes. It's a metaphor for life itself. Always flowing, sometimes quickly, sometimes serenely, often surprising us with its depths and shallows. Headwaters help establish the character of these rivers, and in turn, rivers help define Idaho and the West. We are fortunate because most of our important headwaters are in protected areas. That's a valuable legacy to cherish. It's one of the reasons that Idaho's headwaters are the envy of the world.